It's the George Plaster Show. 30 years of the best sports talk in Middle Tennessee. Featuring Tennessee Sports Hall of Famer, Watson Brown. And it's a shame it's taken this long to get an introduction for this Tennessee Sports Hall of Famer, Kelly Holcomb, along with young gun, Billy Derrick. And now, here's your host, George Plaster. (laughs) They know not what they are applauding. We welcome all of you in. If you're watching this, this is uh, the fourth of our sports speaker series that we have put on. I want to thank Doug Gold and the folks at Wilson Bank and Trust because they are the folks that have made this happen. So let me introduce our guests um, who probably need no introduction, but what the heck. In the middle here is a really good friend going back a long ways in the broadcast business. I'm gonna throw one out at y'all. If you did a Mount Rushmore of SEC announcers, present and past. There are three that are automatic. John Ward at Tennessee, Kay Wood Ledford at Kentucky, Larry Munson at Georgia. Three absolute legends. I think you could make the argument that the fourth ought to be this guy. 33 years as the voice of the Alabama Crimson Tide. Would all of you welcome Eli Gold. Thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. And good to see Mr. Gold here from the bank. I'm hopeful there might be a a commercial loan or something that comes along with his attendance here today. You know, leave it to you to figure that. (laughs) So how do you feel about being on the Rushmore and being the only one who's alive? Well, I certainly like that option. Uh, You know, it's always people people say it's, it's great to see you. And I say, well, it's always better to be seen than to be viewed. Yes. So uh, that's true. But no, I don't know if I'm on the Mount Rushmore or not. That's for other people to say. But I just put you on it. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, but it has been. It was a 36-year run at Bama, and uh, it was spectacular. I loved it. But I'm now turning the, ch- the, the page in the book, and I'm getting together here with the Cats and, of course, with uh, the Jacksonville State uh, Gamecocks doing their broadcasts in Alabama. So uh, I was lucky when Alabama kicked me to the curb after all those years, I was unemployed for about two hours, literally, uh, before Jack State called me. And then uh, I talked to the folks here with the Cats and very quickly put a deal together. So here we are a week away from the season opener. Yeah, hard to believe. Yeah. Let me introduce the other individual on the panel who needs no introduction you all have known him for years uh the first time i ever met jeff i think was over in that trailer park that they called their uh training camp home in bellevue would all of you welcome former titans coach jeff fisher Those were not necessarily the good old days, were they? No. (laughs) I mean, this was a field. There was a little mall over here, but there was really nothing out here other than the little doctor's office there. And uh, they they gave us some trailers. My office was in the trailer, and it overlooked a portion of the only practice field that we had that didn't have irrigation uh, that I think they had just seeded when we moved in. There was dirt. And, um, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, we, uh, we survived here f- for two years, right? right back over there on that grass field. So brings back memories. Nice to see, see it the way it is now, however. It's pretty A little impressive. different story. Yeah. So... Um, I gave Jeff a heads up this morning on the first question that I was going to ask, because if I hadn't done it, there's no way that this is the first thing he'd have thought I'd have asked him. Some of y'all remember this. 
Jim Villers is out there, Louis Belote's out there, I know you all remember it. 26 years ago yesterday, our city got devastated by a pair of tornado touchdowns, one of which blew out the Gaylord corporate building. What it needed to do was knock out our old broadcast center, which was a mile away, which was a dump. But it didn't do that. The other hit sort of in between Channel 5 and the, at the time, under construction, Titan Stadium. So I asked Jeff earlier today a question about whether if, if the tornado had veered to the point where it destroyed what was under construction, would the Oilers have ever come here? Give me some thoughts. This is a typical George Plaster question because we were already here. Mm -hmm. We already moved, right? Yes. Okay, no, I'm teasing. Um, so basically what went down was, it seemed like every year we, while we were here for that two and a half to three, we had some storm issues. This one in particular, um, 26 years ago yesterday. Yeah. How you know what that? everybody's doing right now and the NFLs are getting ready for the draft. Draft was a couple weeks away, probably less than that back then. And um, I mean, our board was pretty much set. Our draft room was about this big right here. And all four walls had different columns of players and not to go into a lot of specifics, but a lot of time years went into this board. They go into, years go into every board every year. So we've got it set. And now we got the forecast and storms. I called down to our video director and asked him to come in to just to take still photos of it because I was concerned that all our work and all our names and all our cards and everything on the draft board was going to get sucked out the windows. So um, we did. We got it taped and, and um, we didn't have any issues. But to your point, we were lucky that year. I mean, there was some damage, uh, like there is all the time. But yeah. um, um, I'm sure that had that thing veered off a little bit, it, it, it was under that construction phase, they probably would have got it back and we would not have missed um, that inaugural game against the Cincinnati Bengals in 99, to which we talked about with somebody here earlier. So we were here um, that same year. This was, um, I'm thinking probably somewhere in that uh, end of September, October range, we had a game scheduled um, against the Cincinnati Bengals, and we, Boomer Esiason was was playing for the Bengals at that time, and we didn't have an advanced scout. We didn't have anybody, but didn't he didn't think about those things. So we didn't have anybody to do pro scouting to go out and do games ahead of time, and so. We had played a Sunday game um, or a Thursday game, and we're waiting over the Sunday to see what's going to happen, who's going to play, and what have you. And I got no way of getting any information on the game. So um, if you exit here and go go right out um, just on the corner there, there used to be a sports bar. I think it's probably still there. I had this great idea. I was going to take uh, – I called over there and said, "Could you guys got satellite stuff here. Would you mind recording the game for me? And they and so they said, no problem. Just bring a tape over. So, I took one of those beta tapes over, whatever the, you call them back then, and and drove off and, and drove around, gave it to them, and uh, came back. And uh, storms were kind of brewing, and I knew that you know the afternoon was going to get rough, and I had decided to go for a little jog, and I was jogging around neighborhoods out there, and. And I thought to myself, you know what, I think I'm gonna go get what I can on this tape and come back before things get bad. And, and so I, wa I jogged over, got the tape, thanked them, and rather than go all the way around, I climbed the fence. And when I climbed the fence, I had the tape, and I went into the building, and there was nobody in the building, in the trailer, they were all in the brick building because we had had, at that point, we had had the tornado warning. So this is like October, same year. And I felt like Steve Martin in The Jerk, you know, where he's standing up there with the new phone books here. I got the new phone books here. I got the tape of the Cincinnati Bengals 
from the game, and we got a tornado coming in, and I thought to myself, this is the NFL. This is, what, this is actually how, they, how it works. So it, it helped us. We went up, and um, Corey Dillon set the rookie rushing record the next weekend against us and, and almost fired Greg Williams after that game. But Wow. So I'm going to get both of these guys to comment on something a few of you want to hear a little bit about. How many Alabama fans are in here? Yay. Okay, so Eli had a front row seat to something we're never going to see again. What Nick Saban did at Alabama, it's a dynasty. Nobody's ever going to repeat to that level. And so all of us are fascinated by him. People talk about him constantly. But this guy knows more than just about anybody because he had a front row seat for all of those Saban years. Tell me a little bit about him and what it is that you say is so special about him that created what he created. Goodness, it, it, that's a great question. Uh, number one, what you, the real Nick Saban is not the guy that you used to be able to see standing behind the podium giving you a 40-second soundbite, uh, being mean, and so on. Uh, he really was and is a very nice guy. He doesn't abide by stupid questions, and he will m let you know that. But he is a genuinely nice man. He cares about people. Uh, he cares about uh, families about your health, about all sorts of stuff. He is a genuinely nice man. With all of that said, however, he obviously has no attention to doing anything differently now than he did 10 years ago. Watch today's date. Today is the 17th of April. Uh, last year's April 17th, and the April 17th of the year before that, and the April 17th the year before that, he did the same thing. Whatever it was, whatever's on the schedule, he did it. That's just the way the man is. He is the most scheduled, the most detail-oriented person I've ever run into. Uh, and he said, hey, it's worked. Why change it? And, and that, was, that was really the truth. But he, he is just, and we were sitting one night doing his coach's call-in show, which was every Thursday evening at a restaurant in Tuscaloosa. And I forget the exact details, but the caller was on the phone talking with the coach, and they got to chuckling about something. It was a fairly, it was a funny exchange. And the coach was talking and laughing and chortling, not that he was going to appear at the, the chuckle hut later that night. Don't get me wrong. He, he had a great sense of humor, but he was, wasn't a comedian. But he was laughing, and I interrupted him. I just stopped him right in the middle of his answer. And I said, folks, bless you, sir. I said, folks, this is the real Nick Saban. What you're hearing right now is the real Nick Saban. Not the guy behind the podium banging his fingers on the, on the podium wanting to get going somewhere else. This is the Nick Saban that we who work with him are blessed to know. And he then cuts me off. The coach does. He said, now wait a second. I said, yes. I, so you're saying that when, when I am in a press conference or something like that, I'm a real schmuck. I said, well, that's your word, not mine, but uh, we're zeroing in right here. And, you know, Miss Terry, his wife, told him the same thing. you got to be nice to people, but he really is. He's genuinely a caring man, and now he's loving life. He's retired. He went the other day to the grocery store. He's enjoying going to the grocery store. He had never, do you realize he had never bought a loaf of bread in 40 years. I mean, he'd been 
in hibernation as a coach. It's hard to picture him in the produce department. Yeah, he's yelling at the, at the how come you're not riper? Well, you know what the right. deal is. But no, he's a, but he's really a, a genuinely nice guy. He is a wonderful grandfather, a wonderful father. Uh, you know, his approach is different than, for instance, Gene Stallings, who was everybody's grandfather. But at the same time, uh, the man has won his share of championships. Jeff, when you watched him, even though you were on the pro level, obviously you paid some attention to him at some point. What stuck out to you from afar about Saban? Well, um, not only did I get the opportunity, as everybody else did, to watch him from a distance. I actually was on campus numerous times, and you know, I had some interaction with him, and and to. Eli's point, he is a really good man. I mean, he, he really is. He, you know, we, in life, sometimes you meet people that kind of act like they're caring or act like they're interested and stuff like that. No, no, he, he listens. He couldn't he do enough attention. for the NFL coaches, man. Coaches, GMs, scouts, open door policy yeah. because he wanted what was best for his players. Well, I'll give you an example. Um, we lost, um, I lost a friend. We all lost uh, um, someone that was fat, part of the fabric of the NFL and, and Chris Mortensen, you know, recently. Um, and Chris's battle with cancer was, was very well known. Um, Nick created an opportunity for Alex to stay on campus and work and help and contribute through numerous offensive coordinator changes over the years um, f for the family because Alex wanted to be close to his father. And that was the one place where he could help out, coach, grow in the coaching world, change different, change his, Nick changed his responsibilities and so on and so forth. But he, he took care of Alex because he cared deeply for his dad, Chris. And uh, a lot of people don't know that, but, um, and now Alex is, is on his way. He's at UAB now with, with Trent. Um, so, but that's how he was. And, um, you know, just, it, it was um, whatever we needed when we went in. Um, he would always set special time aside if we went in, you know, pre-draft and did some workouts or pro days or things like that. And he just went over, went, went well over, way over backwards for us. So um, the other thing that I need to point out is um, it, the personality such was very, very consistent. Uh, you know, and at that level, any level for that matter, you know, your ability to keep winning and losing in perspective is essential. You know, you can't come back on a Sunday or a Monday and act this way after a loss or come back and act this way after a win. He didn't have much trouble with that perspective because he won all the time. <laughs> he, he, he was rarely in a bad mood. You know, he didn't have to, you didn't have to, you didn't get him on a bad day, you know, very often. Not very after, often. Yeah, no. after a loss. And, and that's just, I mean, that's the, what he created, that environment uh, that he created there for, for so long. So over the years, people in sports, and there's several of you here today, I see my buddy Darren McFarland in the back from WNSR. I see Crispy, Terry Crisp, for whom these rinks are named. Crispy, raise your hand. Hey. I saw Crispy on the tube the other day. Two oh, story. I don't know what I was watching on ESPN. There was an old Philadelphia Flyers highlight of a fight somewhere, and with that big red puffy hairdo, which apparently has disappeared over the years. Changed at least. Yeah, changed at least, but uh, it brought back great memories of Crispy. So where I was going with this, and let me also acknowledge the voice of the Nashville Predators, Pete Weber, who's in the back. All right. He was uh, Eli's chauffeur today. So suffice it to say that media people gossip. 
we love to get on the phone. What rumors have you heard? What have you heard? What have you heard? So one day, I don't know if you remember this or not. Um, you you called me, mm -hmm. and a big chunk of the conversation was you're getting a bunch of the the musical group, the Eagles, not the Philadelphia Eagles, but the Eagles. Um, and apparently Saban is a huge Eagles fan. Tell that story. Nick Saban knows every word to every song that the Eagles ever recorded. It's remarkable. He just loves the Eagles, and that's, that's great. Well, I'm on an ES, no, excuse me, a Sirius XM interview show, and the host asked me, tell me something about Nick Saban that I don't know. So I said, hey, he's a great big fan of the Eagles. He, he, he knows every word from Hotel California. I mean, you, you, whatever, every song. He can sing them verbatim. You can check out any time you want, but you can never leave. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and, uh, and that was it. I mentioned that on the air, and we, we went on. Well, I guess it was about a week or so later, and I get a package delivered to my home by FedEx or UPS, one of the two. I opened it up, curious, because I hadn't ordered anything. And in there was a copy of every album that the Eagles had recorded. There was copies of CDs, DVDs, you name it. They were all signed by members of the group. And there was a letter from their PR guy who said, hey, I heard this on the show the other day. We didn't know about this. Can you take this carton of stuff, and it weighed a ton, and carry it to Tuscaloosa and present it to the coach on our behalf? So I did it the next home game. I threw it in the back of the car, and I schlepped it down to the locker room. On, uh, I got my tape recorder in my pocket because I'm getting ready to record the pregame show. And uh, I walk into the coach's locker room and he looks at me because I'd never show up with cartons or anything. And he looked at me and he said, watch this. I said, beware of people bearing gifts. And I said, this came for you. What is it? I said, I'm not going to tell you. You need to open it. And that was a risk on game day. But thankfully, he was, we, Bama was playing a team that they were going to win and beat by 60, one of those easy games. So I, I said, please, open it up. And he opens it up. And he was like a kid on Christmas morning. He's, he's going through all the albums. And he looks, and he sees a song he knows, and he starts humming it and so on. The guy, he's just a regular guy. He's just a regular guy. He just doesn't, uh, you know, he, he, he has finally now gotten his life back. And, and you can understand this, Jeff. I mean, his family, you know, Miss Terry has her husband back. The kids have daddy back. The grand, you know, the grandchildren have uh, uh, papa back, whatever it is. You just can't have a normal life especially when you're as obsessed and as rigid in your approach to the world as Nick was. Just can't do it. Well, I've heard stories, you know, of his recruiting, you know, his trips. And whether I don't know if they're true or not, but he never spent the night. So he would get on the jet on his way to wherever he was going, he would watch the highlight tape of the kid, memorize the, the prospect, the parents, get off the plane, go in, talk to him, come back on the plane, do the same thing to the next one. But he was always back at the, the, the end of the day. The only but, exception was on the West Coast. He didn't make an right. exception for right. that. But you're exactly right. Yeah, that's that's just how, it was a it was a routine. It was a machine. It just and you get caught up in that and and to your point, yeah, there's not much time for anything else. 
So there's an adjustment period. I know you, you've spoken with them and, and things like that, and there'll be an adjustment period. I mean, uh, recently we, we saw him was in front of Congress. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's getting after it for, for good reasons right now to save the game, but because there's nobody in, a, in, in his position that knows better that's, that, that's what is best for this game with respect you know, to the NIL. If there was a job of commissioner of college football, he would be the perfect candidate. He really would. Because he does, as, as Jeff said, he knows everything inside out and backwards. But, uh, but yeah, the other day I also saw a picture. He and Miss Terry were on the boat. He had grown a beard and a goatee. He shaved it off before the, uh, uh, before the spring game last weekend. But he is, he's learning. He's, he's learning how to uh, be a real person. <laughs> and, uh, and Terry said it's been, it's been unusual watching him, you know, pick up and just go somewhere by himself because he always had somebody to drive him. He had this, he had that. She said it's, uh, it's like he woke up from a 40-year hibernation. Wow. Yeah. So... Eventually here, in just a few minutes, we're going to get into the Nashville Cats. And both of these guys are heavily involved in the Cats. I need to ask one question. Are we going to tell the Georgia Tech story on the air or off the air? What Georgia Tech story? My phone call to you. <laughs> I know you remember it. Do uh, I need to refresh your memory? No need, but no, I, 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 that probably will must be best kept amongst oh, us. We'll do yeah. it during the no, we'll do it during the commercial. Oh, okay. They need to hear what a smart aleck you can be. Moi? Yeah. <laughs> Pete, are you in agreement about that? He's got a sense of humor. Okay, we'll go to the break. We'll come back and talk about the cats, but during the break, we'll tell you all a really funny story. Stay tuned from the Ford Ice Center in Bellevue. We're coming back with former Titans coach Jeff Fisher and former Alabama play-by-play -play voice, legendary Eli Gold. It was the most horrible experience that any mother could ever go through. I knew that I needed to get help. My friend, she immediately said, you need to call Bart Durham and you guys were there within an hour. You guys are like family for us. Yeah, sure is nice to connect with the people that you're doing your best to help. As the trusted premier custom home builder in Middle Tennessee, Donnelly Timmons has over 20 years of experience in the industry. Whether you're looking to build your dream home or renovate your current home, their team will ensure that every client and every remodel is unique, luxurious, and completed on time within budget. Founders Dustin Timmons and Joey Donnelly have over 25 years of construction experience in the Nashville area. Together, they have completed projects in Forest Hills, Oak Hill, Green Hills, Franklin, and Brentwood. Dustin and Joey believe that communication is the most important aspect of all construction projects. Therefore, they personally manage each project themselves and are involved in job site activities on a daily basis. Their commitment to quality and integrity has earned them an outstanding reputation among their clients. Contact them to set an appointment for a free consultation or to view some of their completed projects. Give them a call at 615-456-7983 or log on to DonleyTimmons.com. I'm Watson Brown. I'm Kelly Holcomb. I'm Billy Derrick. We're the George Plaster Show. We've been Nashville's best sports talk for the last 30 years. And you know what? We still are. Catch us live weekdays from 2 to 4 p.m. Central Time in Nashville on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Also, the podcast version is available on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Looking for more than just awards and trophies? Southern Trophy House is your one-stop solution. For over 60 years, their team has created lasting impressions with a personalized touch. 
from embroidery to screen printed apparel to corporate awards, signs, and name badges. They have everything you need to keep your brand shining bright. With their knowledgeable customer service team, you can relax as they create, produce, pack, and ship merchandise and awards on time and on budget. That includes etched crystal awards, custom cut acrylic, name badges, embroidered Richardson ball caps, banners, screen printed t-shirts, laser engraved Yeti cups, and knives. Recognize your hardworking team from Southern Trophy House, where they do their best to help you recognize your best. Located at 2705 Nolensville Pike in Nashville, give them a holler, 615-256-7295. Visit southerntrophy.com, Southern Trophy House, for all your personalization and recognition needs. Okay, we are we are back and we welcome all of you back in to our sports speaker series uh, presented by the good folks at Wilson Bank and Trust. Doug Gold and the crew have been nice enough to sponsor this and we've got two great guests today. The legendary Alabama play-by-play -play voice Eli Gold, former Titans coach Jeff Fisher. This is about as good as it gets, and I appreciate all of you being here. So let's spend this segment talking a little Nashville Cats. Jeff, let's start this with you. Tell people your level of involvement and why you've gotten involved. The um, when I when I um, unexpectedly finished my coaching career in the National Football League with the, with the Rams. Um, I did um, what what you're referring to, the same thing that Nick did. I mean, I, you know, I I got a cabin in Montana. I hadn't seen it in the fall in 20 years, so um, I got away for a couple of years, and and um, and then I had some people reach out to me. Um, you know, I was sharing this with somebody, uh, Bill Polian and uh, Charlie Ebersol, and a member of the Alliance of American Football, and they were starting up and. They asked, uh, because of the experience and my, the fact that I'd spent so many years with Bill Pullen on the competition committee, they asked if I would help. So I said no to coaching, and I, I, I actually got in and, and helped. Uh, and that worked out really good. Um, but And then um, I was uh, contacted by uh, Fox several years ago, and they were bringing back. They had the, uh, the official naming rights and uh, majority ownership of the USFL, and I helped them. And so... Over the course of three or four years, I, you know, I, I watched watched leagues um, form, you know, dissipate and all kinds of stuff. But I, um, because of my experience, largely moving franchises and doing things and everything, um, I felt like, um, and, and in addition to that, what what the the way we operated here uh, with the Titans early on, very small. Uh, you know, I was on a mower <laughs> out here, you know, years ago, mowing the practice field, but um, I had the experience. And so um, I got into a meeting and um, about, was it Tamara, how long ago? Five months ago, six months ago, something like that? Four? She oh. said it's a blur. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It was. It's been that long. Uh, so, um, and... Um, they shared with me their vision and, and what they wanted to do. And um, so after numerous sit downs and meetings, I got in and, and uh, offered to help. So, and it's just kind of, it's just kind of taken on from me personally, it's been really fun. It's taken a life of its own. Um, you know, little did I know uh, back then when the cats were rolling, uh, what was really going on. It was only six months ago I found out that they averaged close to 10,000, you know, people at Bridgestone per game for six, seven, eight years or whatever it was. And so, um, you know, one conversation led to the next, and, and here we are. We're less than two weeks away from uh, starting our season, and uh, it's been a, a really fun run. Um, we're uh, very excited about, um, you know, everything that has happened. 
specifically the fact that Eli's here sitting next to me and uh, a lot of things uh, along those lines. But um, the cats are back um, and we're going to um, bring back a lot of the old memories and uh, professionally um, we're, we're going to do a lot of good things. At the end of the day, when the dust settles and everything's done, what are you doing for the community? And that's what, that's what this whole thing is about, is being able to give back. Um, uh, we've been very fortunate to surround ourselves with great people. Uh, everyone from my former, anybody that's been around tri Titans facilities over the years, you know, the original, or at least my original equipment man is now our equipment man, Paul Noska. And we have help from all over. Delmar Smith's here. Do you raise your hand and wave? And I think everybody that, that's familiar with what's going on in this up in the past in this building knows D and, and D's uh, done an amazing job for us. So um, we're bringing them back. And um, we've got, you know, we'll talk about it, I'm sure, in, in due time. But I'll, I'll just hit the hit the major points. We got five games here. Uh, we're going to be playing at Municipal starting on the 27th of April. Uh, we have uh, one additional game up in F&M Bank Arena in Clarksville on Armed Forces Day on, on May the 18th. So a lot of great stuff going on. Um, we hired an outstanding head coach. Uh, our team is in their third week right now, third three and a half weeks of training camp. They're going to, they're winding down this week. We'll cut down and um, we, um, as far as the football is concerned, you know, I'm not there every day. I'm not telling, you know, I don't even know the positions because there's eight guys and everybody can go in motion and everybody's going every direction. And, but um, it, the, it's shaping up. Uh, we'll be competitive and um, we open against the Minnesota Miss. So uh, I'm just really excited because uh, what it's done uh, for me, is it's um, um, it's allowed me to re uh, reunite with a lot of people that I met over the years. Uh, so many people have offered to help and uh, and and didn't want anything in exchange. They just want to be associated with it. Um, I am now a fan of indoor football. Uh, much more so than I was in the past. I have experienced the outdoor 11-on-11 11 11 spring game. Uh, it has its own unique set of challenges. This is fun. This is entertainment. This is exciting. I, I'm, I, I'm confident that uh, once we get started, those people that, that uh, have not awakened, uh, there'll be a reawakening and there'll be a lot of people down there having a lot of fun you know, for, for the duration of all the home games here in town. So some of you all probably know when Eddie George got hired at Tennessee State, Jeff was heavily involved in helping Eddie get a really first-class coaching staff um, in, in a position where had he not been there, it would have been a whole lot more difficult. H have you been involved in any of the picking of players or that kind of stuff? Uh, with respect to the cats, yeah, no, I've given that. I've let Coach uh, Dean do all that. Uh, he's got a great staff. Uh, he has a really good feel for what he's doing, um, and he knows we share the same philosophies. We, you know, it's character first. You know, we want good players. We want players to understand the importance of you know having a relationship and being real with respect to what you're doing in the community. Uh, they, they um, these guys are passionate. They love the game. I'd say you know seven out of ten, eight of the t eight out of ten of the guys that we have on the roster, hoping that maybe somebody will take a peek and maybe they'll get a chance to get into an NFL camp. You know, we can go on, you know, and on about that. Uh, what's what's been interesting to me uh, is how many coaches, but more more importantly, how many officials in the National Football League. Um, cut their teeth or got their feet wet in indoor football. A lot of the, uh, I say a lot, but, a, but there's a good number of referees, the white hat guy, that have experienced at some point or another in indoor football because of the speed and the dynamics of the different rules. And, you know, it just, uh, it's, it, it prepares them. And so, um, you know, there's a, there's a, a lot of, 
a lot of good things that spin out of the uh, indoor and arena football that I wasn't aware of why I was in the middle of you know, my career. So Eli, I've actually done a year of arena football and I wanna hear the first time it happens to you because it's a, it's a natural. Somebody makes a catch and you sit there and you go, you know, fires over the middle complete to Jones at the 20, to the 25, and about the time you're about to say the 30, there is no 30. It'd be That's interesting right. to see if that happens yeah. once. Hopefully not, but you know, this is, I, I was trying to, while Jeff was talking, I was thinking this is gonna be my, my seventh year of doing arena football. Uh, people may not remember, but when the AFL uh, first got a TV package on TNN, the Nashville Network, they did the national broadcast for the Arena Football League, and I was selected to do the play-by-play. -play. We had uh, a number of different analysts. We had Sam White, the great coach from the Bengals. Uh, he was a color man at one point. Uh, uh, Cunningham, Ed Cunningham, a lineman, he was uh, one. Uh, John Riggins was one. Charles Davis, who now works with Iron Eagle, on CBS, he was one of my color men uh, for years. Our sideline reporter was Jill Arrington, among others. And uh, so I did, I, I did the first two or three years on TNN, and then TNN gave up the package to NBC, and NBC was kind enough to hire me because I was the only guy who had experience of doing national TV for the Arena Football League. And I did uh, two more, three more years for uh, uh, NBC. So that was what attracted me. I had been, obviously, to, uh, to Nashville many times, um, having done the Predators for the year that I did and so on. I, I, I loved the market, but I knew how successful the Cats had been in their previous incarnation. So I said, hey, if they just get half those people back, and it looks like it's gonna be more than that, but as it half those people back, you know, you'll fill Municipal Auditorium. You know, it's, it's a fun event. The game, I did my first game, I'll never forget, my first game happened to be a preseason game, and the game was over, and I leaned back with Sam White, we're off the air, good night everybody. And we both went, whew. And we, I mean, you needed an oxygen tent uh, to get through that broadcast. The pace was that frenetic. But they were, you know, but the names were recognizable as they are now. Uh, you know, we've, we haven't even mentioned Kurt Warner. We all know how he did with the uh, Iowa Barnstormers before leading the Rams to the Super Bowl. Uh, it, it was, uh, you know, it, everything is just high speed and a lot of fun. It's a fan-oriented day. You got parties, you got bands outside and so on, but the speed of the game, yeah, there are some differences, certainly. There are nets at the end. You know, it's like the same people who say, well, I don't understand what a blue line is for in hockey. Well, you'll learn. We'll educate you. Uh, very much like Pete and Terry used to do Hockey 101 on their broadcasts years ago and educate the folks. Uh, you know, I plan to do the same thing. Uh, the NFL Network will do the television, will be on the radio, and, uh, you know, when you get the NFL Network on board with you, that adds another element of, uh, of credibility to it. So, yeah, I, I'm, that's what got me to call the cats and say, hey, uh, who's doing your broadcasts? And in short order, it was you are, let's do it. And uh, I'm thankful for that. Beautiful. Jeff, in, in the old days when you were an NFL head coach, if you got an arena football tape, I guess I'll ask this more around the whole league, did people pay attention to it? Um, you know, from a, you're talking about from a scouting or evaluation yeah. standpoint? Um, yeah, I mean, because that's got to be hard to evaluate. Okay, this guy's really good in this league. How would, it, how would it transfer to the NFL, or would it? 
It, it would be difficult. I can't recall. I mean, with ex with the exception of maybe kickers. I mean, Rob Baronis, we signed Rob uh, out of indoor league. And, um, but, um, you know, everything at the NFL level is based on comparison, statistical comparisons and your evaluations. And now all of a sudden you, you, you look at a game, I mean, the college game, the 11 on 11 and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, power five versus, you know, division two or three, there's a difference, but you still, you still can evaluate the player. Your the player evaluation was more difficult, is more difficult um, at that at that time. But now, you know, with technology and everything, you know, you can you can do a lot more. Uh, which brings up a point. I mean, I'm you know, right now there's eight teams playing right now in the spring uh, in the UFL. Right. Um, that's it. So you got the 32 big boys out there. They're getting ready to draft and and once again play in the fall and you got eight other teams so there's no farm system there's nothing out there and so the players that you know that we've signed and that the the other competitive teams in in the league have signed are playing with aspirations of maybe getting somebody's attention and so rather than going out and enjoying it and having a good time and doing all these things this becomes potentially a stepping stone uh, to the National Football League, or at least an avenue where somebody may catch somebody's attention. So, um, you know, I think the timing from that standpoint is extraordinary. After the break, I'm going to ask you all to get involved in this with some questions and comments for these guys. We'll have a microphone over in this corner, and if you won't ask a question on your own, I'll force the issue. Well, that didn't go over as well as I thought it would. So I'll, I'll, I'll politely nudge you uh, because I'd like to have a good uh, back and forth between you all and some things you might want to ask these two guys. We'll go to the break, and you're watching the Wilson Bank and Trust Sports Speaker Series with Eli Gold and Jeff Fisher. Hit After Hit has become the baseball store in Tennessee. They have over 1,000 different models of gloves and over 1,500 wood bats. They also have several iron mic pitching machines as well as a hit tracks machine. If they don't have it, you probably don't need it. We're proud to call Hit After Hit the official shirt provider of the Plaster and Friends Celebrity Bowling Night. Forget the fact that Sir Speedy Music City is owned by my BGA classmate James Warren. Their work stands on its own merit. James and his staff do incredible work, as evidenced by the huge banners at the Plaster and Friends Celebrity Bowling Night. If you're looking for quality to help your marketing and business communications and you want it at a reasonable price, these are your folks. Call them at 615-832-9511 or go to print at sirspeedymusiccity.com and be sure to tell them Plaz sent you. Over the years, more men have started to seek help for hormone deficiencies and imbalances. And Dr. Jeffrey Lodge and wife Daphne, along with their experienced staff, give men the treatment required to improve their quality of life, improve your immune system, energy level, cognitive function, and more. There's no better time to achieve a healthy lifestyle. What are you waiting for? Give Cool Springs MD a call today for an appointment at 615 615- 486-3458 or visit the website coolspringsmd.com For over 35 years Wilson Bank and Trust has been committed to providing customized banking solutions to help individuals, families, and businesses in Tennessee achieve their goals. As your full service community bank we are proud to offer loans with competitive rates, local decision making, and fast friendly service from our experienced lenders. No matter where you are on your financial journey, Wilson Bank and Trust is ready to help you take the next step. Visit your nearest Wilson Bank and Trust office or online at wilsonbank.com to get started today. Member FDIC, Equal Housing Lender. 
Convenience and value, two words that we expect when we do business. Our goal at JHA Company is to deliver just that, both to our school partners and to our customers. Whether you're purchasing photos, yearbooks, class jewelry, letter jackets, school spirit wear, or senior graduation products, we strive to make the experience easy, convenient, and cost-effective. Find out more at jhacompany.com or call 615-867-6345 for more information. JHA, one source, one company. Nashville, get ready for the greatest show on turf, electrifying, high-octane, non-stop spring football action. Starting at only $30. Don't miss the season opener this April 27th at Municipal Auditorium. Hi, I'm Jeff Fisher. The Nashville Cats are bringing arena football back to Nashville. Grab your tickets now at thenashvillecats.com and be part of the action. Star Physical Therapy was established in 1997 with one great mission, to serve. If you're hurting, Don't wait to receive physical therapy. You don't need a referral to see their physical therapist. And early morning and evening appointments are available. Make the call to 615-673-1420 and get rid of that pain. Star Physical Therapy, the official health provider of Football Friday. Okay, we are back, and we're going to take some questions out of the audience for both Jeff Fisher and Eli Gold. We're probably going to have to get Jeff back on the stage before we do that. And if you're watching on the uh, screen, I must have said something because everybody has just kind of vacated this, <laughs> th- this premises here. I think if you had worn deodorant, it would have been better. What's today? Today, April 17th. No, only on the 18th and the 28th of the month. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, <laughs> here we go, and we'll get Jeff back up here in just a second. Tell me your question is for Eli. Eli, I have a question for you, sir. Yes, sir. What is one of the most memorable moments that, as a broadcaster, you're watching, and it just kind of takes you by, you're just, and, and, amazement of what you just saw and it affected how you called it and and how, how you recovered from that moment where wow. you forget you're broadcasting and you're watching what you just saw well it's a great question there are a lot of things and and i i'm glad you i'm glad you phrased it as memorable as opposed to not favorite you know the alabama loss on the kick six to auburn was memorable Sure as heck wasn't the favorite, but it was memorable. Uh, I was the guy talking when Dale Earnhardt hit the wall and lost his life at Daytona. Uh, that was my call. And uh, so when you listen to that on radio, it's me describing the, the passing of one of the all-time greats. Certainly not a, favor- a favorite, but it was definitely memorable. So, uh, you know, those are name, those are certain events. Uh, as far as a memorable one again, the, uh, the Alabama win over Georgia for the national championship after Nick Saban brought in Tua Tongovaloa to replace Jalen Hurts at halftime. And then, uh, you know, here's a true freshman, Tua, taking a sack. Next thing you know, it's, you know, second and 26. And uh, all of a sudden, he throws a touchdown to Devontae Smith to win the national title. Uh, that was hugely memorable. Uh, there have been so many. You know, I've, 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 I've been blessed that I, I've done NASCAR for 41 years. I did Alabama for 36 years. Uh, there are just so many memorable and, in some cases, favorite moments. You know, from a personal standpoint, having sold peanuts at Madison Square Garden as a kid and then going back to the garden to do my first broadcast there, that was personally very, very special. Doing my first broadcast at the Montreal Forum when I did the St. Louis Blues broadcasts, uh, that was 
you know, you got Roger Doucette singing the national anthem. You've got the atmosphere that was just unbelievable. Uh, you know, that was very, very special. So there are many, there are many uh, that come to mind. Awesome, thank you. Coach Fisher, I have a quick question for you. Um, of all your years of coaching, you have to evaluate a lot of players, both from a draft standpoint with the draft coming up, but also once they're in camp. Has there been a player that maybe you passed on that you had the opportunity to draft or was in camp and you let them go where in hindsight you were like, man, I wish I didn't let that guy get away. Is there anybody that comes to your mind? Um, not, not here, uh, but uh, when I was in St. Louis, yes. Um, and it was just a, it was a communication issue. You're, you're trying to get all the information and do the best you can and evaluate as many as you can and, and getting to know different scouts and evaluators. But that one would, uh, that player is Bobby Wagner. <laughs> So you all know who Bobby Wagner is. Um, I, you know, we tried to get around to him and did the best we could, but he's the one that fell through the cracks. For some reason, I trusted some guys, and I'll take responsibility for it, but we had a late third, fourth round pick on him, and um, I'd actually watched him, I th Utah State, I think, and I watched him, my son uh, played at Auburn, and um, I watched him open at Auburn in person, and um, I, got, I, I made a mental note. I got to find out who that dude is, and I forgot never did. So it would be somebody like that, Bobby Wagner. But um, I'm sure you were looking for somebody, um, somebody a little more well known. Um, I did. The other side of that is um, Aaron Donald recently retired. Um, we, you know, I had a hand in drafting Aaron and, um, the, uh, not surprised that he had the career that he did and for him to be able to walk out, uh, walk away on his own terms was extraordinary. But, um, as far as the Titans are concerned, there were so many, so many guys over the years with, uh, um, talented, talented players that, um, I mean, they're, they're household names for y'all and they're. And they're great people and were great players. I mean, Chris Johnson. I mean, I mean somebody like the likes of the talent and the speed that he had, and uh, and not to not mention so many of the other guys. But um, you know, as as Eli was saying, I mean, the years stack up, man, and the memories and things like that. And those are my memories. As just um, and that's what I miss is that is those players, you know, and. And you'd be surprised how many of them I stayed in touch with or give me a, give me a shout every once in a while. The Thanks. years stack up. Boy, does that feel really true. Right, Pete? Whew. Let's go back into the audience. Um, this will bring back a memory or two. It was stupid on my end. Robert on a car phone. Uh, yes, sir. Eli... And Jeff, I've heard about you guys for years in this UL Plaster, and it's an honor to finally meet y'all. Eli, earlier Jeff uh, touched on the April 16th story. Uh, do you have any, were, were you in Tuscaloosa during the Alabama tornado? I was not. Wow. I was in Birmingham, but my daughter was on campus. She has graduated uh, years ago. She graduated from the University of Alabama. And um, we were on the phone with each other. She got into the bathtub and covered herself up with a mattress. And thankfully, the uh, tornado missed her immediate neighborhood. She uh, had a place literally a block away from Bryant-Denny Stadium. And the uh, tornado, tornado went about a mile the other way. So uh, thank God she was spared. But, uh, you know, we all new people who were impacted uh, in one way or the other. And, uh, you know, one of our players lost his girlfriend uh, in, in that uh, deal. And then, of course, riding around town afterwards, when I did get back into Tuscaloosa, uh, being able to see things that you never used to be able to see because trees were leveled and buildings were knocked down. So it was a, 
a, a scary time, but thankfully for the Gold family, uh, we were all safe, and, and our daughter uh, weathered everything, and we were able to stay in cell phone contact with her, uh, and we also were watching it on television, so we knew all the geographical layout, we knew where the storm was going, and we realized she was going to be okay. But uh, thank you for asking. That was quite uh, the memory. Eli, this next question comes from a young man who goes to CPA, Silas Bryant, who thinks he wants to get in this business. He asked me some, for some advice a while back, and I told him, get the hell out before you get in. <laughs> uh, what advice would you have for him? I would say jump in with everything you've got. Amen. There's no, you know, you've got to learn things. You have to obviously be able to, there is some God-given ability in there somewhere, but you've got to be able to construct a good English sentence. Uh, you know, I was a terrible student, but I did pay attention to English class. But nothing is too small to help you. I used to walk, and again, I grew up in New York City, and I would walk past a schoolyard and there were kids playing basketball on the schoolyard. Didn't know them, had no idea who the heck they were, but I just hung on the fence and did the play-by-play, -play and I made up names. It didn't matter. I did the same thing growing up again in New York uh, and at, at Yankee Stadium. And of course, in those days, the bleachers, you could get into 65 cents at Yankee Stadium. The upper deck was $1.05. So it's not like it is today, but I used to sit in the upper deck all the time at Yankee Stadium with my little tape recorder, and I'd go to the worst seat as far away so I didn't bother anybody. And the I'd, Euchre seat. Yes, the Bob Euchre seat. I'd go on the Wednesday afternoon when the crowds were never as big, and I would just do the play-by-play. -play. And I wasn't so concerned about the facts or the statistics. I was concerned about the descriptive skills that I was trying to hone. So, you know, go to a local high school, go to college games, do whatever you can, do the repetition, and then get out there and enjoy what could be the, you know, I've been to all 50 states, I've been to so many countries in this world, all because of sports broadcasting. So I would encourage you to, to jump in whole hog. What do you got for these guys? Well, the good news is I do the same thing for my travel baseball team, and they have to tell me to shut up because I'm talking too loud over in the corner. They'll get but, over uh, it. Don't worry <laughs> about it. Um, my question is for Jeff. Obviously, we were saddened to hear the passing of Frank Wycheck about six months ago. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience with him and maybe a story you have? I know everyone knows the Music City Miracle, but you got to see him every day. So. Yes. Uh, thank you for bringing it up, and I was going to bring up this point. Um, if you want to play quarterback, imagine being in a room with Joe Montana, Tom Brady, and Bart Starr, because that's the room you're in right now with Eli and Pete and Terry and George. So you're in good company here. So um, You're much too kind, sir. Thank you. Flattery will get you everywhere. Yeah, it got me up here. Uh, <laughs> so, so um, before all this, before we actually settled here uh, in Nashville, um, we were we were the Houston Oilers. That was my first year as the first full year as head coach. It would have been '95. I took over as interim in '94. We had just drafted Steve McNair. Washington Redskins had just drafted Heath Shuler. Um, you know who Heath Shuler is. We fly to Marysville College in East Tennessee to practice against the Washington Redskins. Norv Turner was the head coach at the time. Norv Turner was my receiver coach when I played ball at USC. So Norv and I were, were friends and so Imagine this, I've got the Oilers, my team, and his team practicing at, at Marysville College. Day two or day three, you know, Norv and I are just kind of watching practice. I'm going, you got anybody that, that you're not going to be able to keep that I may 
be able to, to, to use or at least make my roster specifically on offense because I, we had come from an exclusively run and shoot four wide receiver offense the year before, had no tight ends on, on the roster. And, and about midway through that week, Norv says, yeah, that, 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 uh, that, that H-back kind of tight end dude over there, Wycheck, he, he goes, um, I don't think he's going to make it. He's just a little undersized. And I said, well, he's just perfect for us and what we need. And he goes, well, he goes, why don't you just call me back as we get the cut down and I'll, I'll trade him to you for a seventh if and whenever. And I said, okay. So anyway, um, he called, you know, before the draft or so. I was like, are we still on for that? I go, I'm not going to give you a pick for him because you're not going to, you're not going to get anything for him. You're going to cut him and I'm going to claim him. And, and, and that happened. They released him, and we signed Frank, and that's how Frank became a Oiler slash Titan. So that I mean, it went all the way back to to when I started. So um, the memories of Frank were were obviously, you know, there there were so many of them. And and when you talk about um, a, a great teammate, um, that's the ultimate compliment. Uh, from your peers, that's what he was. He was a great teammate, um, very unselfish, um, motivated, tough, and all those things. And then, you know, what can you say about, you know, the Music City Miracle? I mean, that was, it was uh, one of the greatest plays in NFL playoff history. And had it not been for Frank, um, you know, who knows what would have happened. But thanks for allowing me to talk about Frank. Two hours after the, the play happened, Frank had agreed to come over to the Wild Horse. We had a, a most successful radio promotion I've ever been involved in. We were packing people into that place, and they were crocked. I mean, you wouldn't dare go out into the audience to get questions for any segment. Well, I didn't think Frank would come. You know, he's got all the media asking him about the play, and it's about Five o'clock, it's about an hour and a half after the play happened. If you all remember, it was an 11.30 start time on a Saturday morning. And they had this curtain. It looked like Johnny Carson's show. They had a curtain um, back there. And we're in a commercial break. And Frank yells out to me, Plaz, daddy's home. <laughs> and when he came out there, it was like a rock star ovation. I had never heard anything like that. But none of those people remember because they were <laughs> crocked. Man, did they sell some booze that day. Okay, moving right along past the uh, alcohol hour, your question for these guys. Well, first of all, I want to thank you guys for being here. What a day. It's been uh, incredible to say the Pleasure. least. Pleasure. This is for Coach Fisher also. And almost stole my thunder. I was going to ask a little bit about why check, but under difficult circumstances, coach, uh, I was uh, privileged to hear you speak at the McMahon Memorial and also the Heimerdinger funeral service. And having said that, did you speak at Frank's service and tell us a little bit about the difficulty under, you know, extremely difficult circumstances at speaking at a, at a service like that? I did not. Um, I spoke <coughs> when, um, uh, when Frank passed through two or three days after, uh, a lot of the guys got together, former players, his teammates and coaches, and we just kind of had a private session. Um, and so we did, uh, I did get a chance to just to kind of address the group and, and everything. It was, um, it, was, uh, it was a reunion that was much needed under difficult circumstances. It, it, why does it take something like that to get these guys back together? And so I realized at that point um, through the passing of Frank that, um, and I think that this is the case, you know, not, it, not just exclusive to, to the, the Titans in that era, but um, any other professional team um, and, and those great players that played uh, and their careers are over, and they're, they've gone on with their lives, there's a, there's a, a, a hole, and, and the, there's, a, there's something missing. And uh, to be able to bring guys back, again, under difficult circumstances, but put that aside, to bring them back um, and, and put them in the same room and let them talk and let them share and, 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 
it, it, it made me realize the importance of uh, get, reaching out and putting something together for, and for me personally, for the former Titans that, that have all moved here, and, and former NFL players for that matter. There's a mental health component, that's what I'm getting at, and they need to be able to get together and, 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 and bond and tell stories and, and share. And, and so we let things settle with respect to Frank's passing, but that was one of the things that we all agreed to do was um, let that become part of Frank's legacy. Um, and, 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 and Frank's name, you'll be hearing some things that we're going to be putting together is what I'm, what I'm getting at. Um, so as far as Steve and I mean, uh, you know, um, it's just, I mean, it's hard at the time, but looking back, I, I was honored. Um, you know, I'll tell you a cool story now. I think I can tell it, but, um, probably, I don't know, it was probably five or six years after, well, let me let me share this with you. I did um, six months ago. Um, I was reached out by a Netflix group, a team, producers, and and so on and so forth, um, and they wanted to do something on Steve. And I was a little apprehensive about it, um, like anybody would be. Um, fielded numerous calls, Zoom calls, and things like that, and I agreed to do it. And we we did it. Um, I'm very blessed. I have a farm, you know, about six or seven miles from here. So we went out and I invited him out. We did a, a shooting and um, it's about a four hour deal. And it's not finished yet. It's, it's a work in progress. It's going to come out. And this is on Steve's life. This is not on Steve's, about Steve's death. And um, it, was, it was highly emotional, three or four hours out there. Um, we have a couple more components to put together. I'm guessing this thing is going to be out hopefully in the next maybe six to eight months, and it'd be something that you're not going to want to miss. It was remarkable um, because it tells his story and you know and, and and how he lived and you know and everything. But the the point I wanted to make is that um, I got a phone call. I hope I'm not jeopardizing anybody, but. Um, I got a phone call from somebody that told me that um, regardless of what happens in the future, that uh, Steve McNair is in the Hall of Fame. And um, this was a, a trophy company that was redoing the Pro Football Hall of Fame, one of the rooms there, and they're putting in new trophies and stuff like that. and. Um, she didn't tell anybody but me, and now I'm breaking my promise to her, but it's been so long. She stuck his picture up underneath one of the trophy exhibits uh, at the Hall of Fame, didn't tell anybody. And it was installed and put in there. And I had, in the last three years, been up there, and I saw it. And I'm not going to tell you where it is, but it's there. And Steve is, and his picture is already in the Hall of Fame. But I believe that when the Netflix thing comes out, that there'll be a lot more talk about Steve going to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So thank We're, you for that question. That's great. That's great. We're going to take two more questions out of the audience, and then we're going to give away four tickets to the Cats home opener. It will be a Jeff Fisher broadcasting question. How about that? Ooh. Yeah. This question's for Eli. Uh, some would say that Coach Saban did his best coaching job last year. I would agree. Uh, despite not winning the national championship. Yep. Do you think if it were not for name, image, and likeness and the current state of free agency in college football that he'd be on the sidelines still this year? And what do you well, think about that in general for the, the sport? Okay, as far as it, – it's tough for me to answer for him. You know, it's uh, – you'd have to ask him directly. But those were certainly contributing factors. Were they the whole thing? Well, you know, the man is, is in his mid-70s, and that's not old by any stretch of the imagination, but he's not in his mid-40s either. I think he wanted to enjoy the family and, and, and enjoy the, 
the fruits of his hard work over the years. So I don't know if it was the only reason, but I think it probably hastened his decision. I don't think there's any question about that. You know, as far as the NIL name, image, and likeness, as Coach Saban always said, he had nothing wrong with the players earning additional coins. He was very much in favor of that. It was just the way the whole thing happened. He used to bring recruits over to the house all the time, and he and Miss Terry would entertain the families and what have you, and you know, try and recruit them to Alabama. And the and Miss Terry was the one who said, you know, why are we doing this anymore? When I'm sitting down with the kid and his parents, all they're asking me now is, how much are you going to pay? How much are you going to pay? They didn't care about his improving his character, improving this, improving that. How much are you going to pay? And that's what he hated about the pros. It was something that he just was not comfortable with in the money end of it, you know? When he was in the pros, obviously, he couldn't begrudge anybody what they made, and he never did. He, he supported the players. But at the same time, he had a problem not being able to mold these people. And, you know, when you were working with a, you know, a, a, a 8, 10, 12-year veteran, you're not going to mold him anymore. He is who he is. And he, he missed that as this college game has, uh, has been changing. The other thing is the uh, transfer portal. That was a very, very, you know, he always said when they were negotiating, should we do this or not? He always said, be careful what you ask for. You may get it. Because Alabama was always going to benefit from the transfer portal. And yeah, there have been a couple of times when they've lost guys as well. But if a guy wants to leave Alabama and go to wherever, I'm not going to cite any place, but if they wanted to go wherever, you know, that makes no sense. And I don't say that as an Alabama fan. I'm saying that as a, of a, of, as a normal observer. There's nothing you're missing at Alabama. The best facilities, the best fan support, the best everything. You want to leave there and go to Iowa with no disrespect to the Hawkeyes, but you know what are you going to get that you're not getting in Tuscaloosa? Those are the kind of things that bothered him, and uh, especially when he thought that Alabama was best for you, but you still wanted to go elsewhere. So I think all of those things contributed uh, to the NIL. You know, the transfer portal, what are you going to do? I mean, if a kid wants to transfer, you know, God bless him. What are you going to do? Let him go where he wants. This is America. You know, this is what you can do. Um, it's not always the best decision. But, you know, a lot of these guys who transfer also, not all of them, but they also see the handwriting on the wall. They know that, you know, they're still number four on the depth chart at their position. And they know, they know when they get off that practice field, they know if they're ever going to be good enough to unseat number one, number two, number three. They know that. When they look themselves in the mirror, that guy staring back at them in the mirror knows the answer. And they decide to go elsewhere because they feel their choices and their chances of playing are better. And you can't blame a person for that. But all of that stuff contributed to his decision, I'm sure. Okay, last question out of the audience. Go. All right, I'm a little nervous. This question is for Coach. Uh, first of all, thank you. I actually like football because of you and the Titans. As a little kid, I grew up with you guys. Um, hypothetical, we just had a great hypothetical question. I have another one for you. So you got, it hasn't been you know, seen yet, but the upcoming season got the new drop tackle, hip tackle rule coming up. If that was in 1999, do you guys get a redo? Do you guys maybe have a Super Bowl ring on your finger? Could you, could you restate that again? I'm oh, sorry. The, so I think the upcoming NFL season, you got the drop uh, tackle or hip tackle rule. I think it's like a 15-yard penalty or something coming up. 
So Super Bowl uh, 2000, you guys are down the field, it's short by one yard, you know. So do you guys think if in 99, if that was back then, if that's implemented then, do you guys get a redo? Do you think you guys win the game? No, we, we, uh, we win the game if um, Kevin runs the route correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Period. I'm sure he'd appreciate hearing that. I'm teasing. He hears it all the time. No, it was a great play by Mike, and it just happened. But um, no, there was um, there were a lot of things in that particular game. I appreciate you bringing the question up um, that that could have changed the outcome. Um, we were wounded going into that final drive, uh, defensively especially. People said, "Would you gone for two? Mm, no, but, uh, I was never going to go for two. Had we scored, I wasn't going to let a decision that I made." rob our players and our fans of a chance to win a, um, you know, a championship. But um, certainly a lot of good things happen in that. And rules are going to change, man. Rules are going to change. And, you know, they've, you know, they've, been, they've been ongoing. Um, I, you know, from a safety standpoint and things like that, I mean, that's the genesis of most rule changes. And, you know, we're going we're gonna to see a lot of those here this coming season. One in particular, aside from the one that you're bringing up, is the... Um, the kickoff. Kickoff rule. Kickoff yeah. is going to be going to be interesting to say the least. Okay. Last thing we're going to do. So in theory, we have like six broadcasters here today. In but the there's theory, one, two, three, four, five. Get Billy in there. And Billy is six. But I think we've got a seventh. Because if I remember, did you not do an NFL game on Fox as an analyst? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes, I did. I went to a sports bar to watch you. Can anybody tell me the two teams that played in that game four tickets to the Cats opener? Just shout it out. Not all at once now. <laughs> Rams and Titans. No, no, no. I'll help you. Um, it was our um, secondary home field. Does that help? Is that a clue? Jacksonville, yes. And um, the Alltel Jeff Fisher Memorial Stadium. Anybody give up? It's, I did the Jets at Jacksonville. Um, so um, let's see. Uh, Joe and Troy, or Joe had to jump back into baseball. And um, they were doing Thursday, Sundays. And they got out of this Sunday. And so um, they just kind of pushed everybody up. And then they pushed me in. I got to do a game. It's crazy because I, well, do you want, did I, have I ever told you about the story? It was great. So Jacksonville, um, the stadium is a north-south stadium, the noon game. So uh, the sun is right there. So I got no chance of seeing the telestrator. So I can't do anything because of the glare in the press <laughs> box, number one. I'm done. That's uh -huh. over. Okay. The other issue was, and jo George knows this. Um, in preparation for it, I went to Fox Studios and they um, they said, "Hey, um, we're going to do uh, we're going to do a, a mock game here. We're going to give you six teams to memorize, and uh, we will pull out one game, which includes the two of those six teams. You can memorize the rosters, and we'll do a game that's already been been played." And I'm going like, "Why am I? You telling me to memorize six freaking rosters when?" It's only going to be two rosters. Why don't you just tell me who it is so I can figure it out? And, and so they finally did, and so I did the game. But what's interesting is that, and you guys appreciate this, and um, I don't have any, I have a hearing loss in my right ear. I'm all messed up. So it was a birth defect. So um, now I'm, so te theoretically I'm only hearing in one ear, but when you got to produce, you got your, your color, or your play-by-play -play guy one ear and you got producer and stuff in the other was my understanding. Well, 
I got nobody in this here, so uh, <laughs> other than the play-by-play. -play, so what they decided to do Who did you work was, with? Do you remember that day? Who was your play-by-play -play guy? Um, I'll think of it. Um, yeah, um, give me a second. Really good guy. Uh, Dan, um, I'll think of it. But anyway, so the producer says, hey, we got this all figured out. Um, so they just jumped in the same ear. Now I got two guys talking in one ear. <laughs> and they're going to break, and we got three, two, one, and I'm here at Dan. Uh, um, starts with an H. Huh? Dan Hicks? No. Dan I'll, Hicks? No, no, no. no, no he's he never at Fox. He did golf for NBC. Uh, is it Helly? Yes. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Nice, Billy. Really, huh? No, we, I enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah. So the reason I... And me personally, I mean, I, they gave me an opportunity to do it once, you know, once I got kicked to the curb uh, with the Rams. Uh, but I just couldn't see myself going to Seattle on Thursday night, going out and watching the sea after beating the Seahawks the year before and the Arizona Cardinals doing production meetings with Pete Carroll and the Seahawks on Friday and then and Bruce Arians and the Cardinals on Saturday and doing their game having just beat them the year before. I just was not comfortable with, with that. And so, but I loved every minute of it. The, the thing that was interesting to me when the game was over, I went down the elevator at Alto or whatever they called it, and I went into the, I went into the, the trailers and thanked everybody, all the video and sound and all the producers and stuff, and got on the bus to go to the airport, and I didn't win or I didn't lose. It's like weird feeling after a game. So, yeah, that was my claim to fame. I never heard back from them, by the way. They never said you did good or, but. Um, I know what that feels like. Do you? <laughs> yeah, I do, as a matter of yeah. fact. Um, Tamara over in the corner, if you beg nice, might give you some tickets the home opener just thought i'd throw that in there okay i want to thank these guys for taking their time i hope you all have enjoyed this you've been a great audience pleasure a pleasure to be here with everybody first of all i'm thrilled that eli is here and in good health because some of you who uh know a lot about alabama know that boy he was really fighting it 18 to 24 months ago yeah it is great to see you thank you yeah cancer wasn't going to beat me i'll tell you that i'm too damn stubborn i love it <laughs> i love it <laughs> jeff thank you for being here you bring a lot of great memories from football past 20 years ago that we would have never experienced had he not been the head coach we're out of here for the show. Thanks for being with us. Um, nothing else to say other than thanks to the folks at Wilson Bank and Trust for sponsoring this sports speaker series. We will do another one of these sometime like July. So just stick around and uh, we'll figure it out. See you tomorrow. <laughs>